Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I do, I have a little bit of surgical thing here and I'm covering it up for all of your benefit. So um, it's 6.01, call the meeting to order. And um, I don't believe we have any adjustments to the agenda. Anyone who would like to speak tonight, raise your hands and we'll get the microphone to you or you can come and get it, whatever works out the best. Um, that's the only way we can be sure the people on Zoom can hear it. This is uh, an in-person and Zoom meeting tonight. Um, and I don't believe that we're not on Facebook as far as I know. So um, the first item of the agenda now is the approval of the minutes from the July 30 meeting. And I guess I'll sit for a motion. If Sabrina makes the motion to accept this printed, any done? Second? Any discussion on the minutes? Go ahead. I don't. I, I talked quite a bit the last time, and you did an excellent summary of my presentation. Oh, oh, Anyway, you did an unbelievable summary. It was very concise and I, I thought it was awesome. There. I will pass the wipes around with the mic going forward. So, any public input for starters? Thank you. Uh, we've missed, I told you already, we've missed you. So. <laughs> No, it is not. We're it's having Facebook integration issues with Zoom right now. Oh. Okay. So it is on Zoom. I put that. I posted it. So everybody on Facebook should know that they can go to the Zoom link that's on the Facebook event. So you can access it through Zoom, just not through Facebook right now. Are you trying to get it on Facebook? Not right now. No. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's okay. So um, I raised my hand. Can you guys hear me? Maria McIntyre. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I have a couple of questions. Unfortunately, I don't have the agenda, um, but I have a couple of questions and comments about the last meeting, and I don't know how you answer that or how it's going to play out, but um, I do know, are, are there any committees that I can join as the parent right now? I know I missed the last committee, but are there any committees now? I'm not aware. Is there any committee, active committee at this point? That so the school-based committees are working. Um, still, at the high school, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So I know the elementary school has a uh, committee going, the middle school still has committees going, and the high school has committees going. So working on final details. OK, so can I can that? just get on. OK, so I can just get on like the um, the the website and look for committees is that right Lori? should yeah contact the building principal that you're focusing on okay and thank you um the maintenance plan so i have um some selfish ideas that i want to get some ideas from the maintenance plan because there's a lot of potions out there and new things um that are saying that it's killing the covid virus and so I know that um, there's lots of things out there and I just wanted to know if there was any type of public notification of the maintenance plan. Did you get that? Is it the maintenance plan? Yeah, I'm not sure. Like public. Well, no, just like um, the different things that they're going to use. Like I know that, for example, the 50 to 1 ratio for bleach will kill it. Um, there's no Lysol wipes anywhere, pretty much. Um, I know that there's the machine that's going to, I don't want to call it that, Lori, but the the, the frogger. Um, so I'm just wondering what types of things are going to be utilized to clean the rooms. So we had a training scheduled for tomorrow, uh, Wednesday. And it's going to be rescheduled for the following week because we're still waiting for some supplies. 
We're following CDC guidance, guidance and um, we will be using materials that are approved uh, by the EPA. But yes, we will be able to provide a list of materials that we're using to clean and disinfect the schools. Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so my, I guess my first question um, is about face masks as a dress code. I know that it was, Don brought it up in the last, the last meeting and I didn't catch it, but is that gonna be a dress code? Are face masks going to be a dress code? Is that your question? Yeah, sorry, I didn't phrase okay. it very good, but is it gonna be part of the dress code? Masks will be required for all schools and staff. You know, that's, okay. as time goes on, if we have no cases, the board and the, and the administration will, will review the, the data. So in four to six weeks, if it doesn't seem like we need to have as strict a guidance, maybe we can consider um, adjusting the guidance. I mean, a lot of districts are looking at kind of a green, a yellow, and a red kind of zone. Green is, we have very little, um, very few numbers or disease in the county or your community. We're going above and beyond the recommended guidance. Um, there are many districts that are just having students wear masks when you're unable to socially distance or in the common areas. We're going one step further to try to keep our keep the virus out of our school. Uh, it doesn't mean that we'll have to do that forever, but at this point, yes, that would be required in school. Okay. Good point. You know, for Water breaks, recess breaks, outside breaks. You don't have to wear a mask when you're eating your lunch. But yeah, for all intents and purposes, we believe that having masks on will help keep the virus out of the school. Okay. Because um, I, I can see that. <laughs> we, I Obviously, you guys already know that's going to be a potential interesting past, or it's going to be interesting. Anyway, so... Um, as I was going through processing the last meeting and just watching and, you know, hearing all the different types of opinions that are on the board, um, I just want to mention a couple things about um, like risk, leadership, accountability that the school board is um, going to be coming up against in the next month. So I bet none of you, <laughs> none of us really have realized what this is really doing. So um, the last meeting, uh, the four, there was a lot of comments going around. One of it was, um, I don't know if you, uh, it's recorded, so I don't know if, if you remember on um, the Facebook page, somebody commented that kids are immune to this. We also have a president who said that kids are immune to this. So I really, and there was a discussion on the board I saying just, um, kids oh. have low immune, no, I'm sorry. So I kids don't think have anybody low. said they were, that kids are immune. They're less susceptible to the symptoms of the virus. Okay, according, according to whom? And I would like you to cite that because you are leaders in this community you are not listening to Nurse Rastelli, a, a professional, an expert in this field. And for you to say that publicly is giving people in this community a different perspective. And I want you to be held accountable for it. And I'm well, trying let's, not to... Let's be clear what we're being held accountable for. N nobody said that they were immune that I heard of. Did anybody say they were immune? Did I... Did anyone... No, I'm saying, I am saying that the president said it's our to this. This community on Facebook wrote that kids are immune to this. So the Facebook people are reading this. Okay. They're watching you. And for you to say that they're less susceptible may not get across to other people as, oh, well, they're less susceptible. Yeah, than my grandparent. Okay. But I mean, I just want you to be very cognizant of that. And, you know, based on the fact that Nurse Rostelli, all the scientists are saying, you know, it's just really interesting to me. And as leader as well, you guys don't know it, but you're leaders. 
you don't represent what my feelings are in this, but you know, um, there's three, the three that voted not to go back in person. Definitely, you know, they understand the factors, but for <clears throat> a leadership, I would suggest that good leadership comes from experience going into the trenches. I challenge you to sit with those nurses every day, and take temperatures. I challenge you to be there on the first day of school, watching the kids come in. Some of them are gonna be scared. I guarantee those high school kids are scared. So I challenge you to substitute teach, to observe anything so that you get the feel, you get the emotions, that you get a sense of what you're asking these kids to do. Okay. Do, so, do, um, do you have a lot more points to make? I'm just trying to gauge how far we're going to yeah. go. Oh, yeah. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Um, you've already done that. So I'm just wondering how far you're going. What, what about you're five going? more minutes. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So another couple of points. So Don brought up the idea of the H, the HVAC system, I think it's called. Yes. Yeah, of the school. So Don brought it up. I remember him asking, and that was recorded too. And I think John dismissed it and said, oh, it's fine. Was there any discussion on that? I'm not exactly clear what your question is, but the HVAC system filters have been changed. They're um, scheduling a cleaning for it, I believe, still. They've been clean. So that's all been maintained and brought up to uh, full capacity at this point. That is an excellent answer. However, if you go back and record, if you go on the recording system and Don asked it, John said, yeah, they're fine. So I didn't know that. Okay. The next That's thing is, um, the next thing is that Dylan Farr, he brought up the fact that there are active COVID positive um, cases in Lincoln. It was true. I was watching it. It's on the CDC website for the state, whatever. So dismissing each other like that, it's not going to be good. Like, I, I just can't believe that. I was appalled. I'm like, okay, that's nice. Um, and so, I wonder if Nurse Dresselli, like she almost made me cry. I wonder if you saw her in person. Like, can you see us on Zoom when you're sitting there? Yes, we can. Okay, I was wondering, like, cause she almost made me cry. Like she was imploring you. And I'm wondering if that was a male doctor or if another doctor or somebody that was saying, please don't send these kids back to school. They're gonna get sick. I'm wondering if that would change your vote. I, I, don't, I don't think it would out of the four people that voted. It seems like you already made the decision before even anything was happening. So um, I guess the last thing I would like to say is that, oh goodness, um, the, according to like the statistics, according to what's gonna happen is that I'm, I'm hoping that you're ready because six degrees of separation from that school, for those kids going into that classroom, there's 10 kids and a teacher, six degrees from the, like if those kids go home, they go to the grandparents who are taking care of them after school now. If one of those people, one of those people in this community, one out of 3,000 gets sick and they do the contact tracing back to the school, I, got, I, I mean, the four people that voted for that to go back in person. I hope they're ready for that accountability because where else are we gonna go? And that's my point. Um, I appreciate it. I couldn't be on the school board just because of so many, this is a really difficult time and I couldn't do it. So I appreciate that. Um, and I, I hope everybody stays safe. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any, anybody else tonight? Is there, can you hear me? You can. Okay. Um, so I wanted to, I know that Lori, I know Lori just got back from vacation, so I'm sure catching up with emails is really difficult. But I'm curious to know why we chose foggers to disinfect our schools. Where did that 
I just, I'm trying to get the sense of why we chose that and what kind of cost that was um, to our school. Bert's here. No, he's on Zoom. Do, can we get Bert to respond to that then? Yes, they're not fathers, they're static sprayers. And the reason they were chosen is because that is widely accepted as the best solution to make our classroom safe. And they're the easiest to use. They're, the father, the, now you got me doing it. The electrostatic sprayers that we have chosen are handheld units, they're battery operated. And they're somewhere in the neighborhood of $900. And we've ordered one for each school. So when you say that they're easier, what does that mean? Like what, why, like when you say easy, because to me, with my, my background in just environmental, um, uh, you know, just my environmental background as far as chemical-based cleaners and disinfectants. To, to me, spraying an entire classroom with disinfectants and having that solution, because you're still using a solution, so I'm sure the solution has a part to play in it, right? Am I correct? I mean, you're saying electrostatic, but there is a solution that's being used. There is, and it's put into a fine mist that is electrically charged and actually chemically or electrostatically bonds to the surfaces to give the maximum amount of contact and the slowest, uh, the most efficient amount of drying time. Any disinfectant, you need to have what they call a dwell time. And that dwell time for the specific um, chem chemical that we're using is five minutes. It's a, it's a solution called ES64 put out by Environmental Solutions. Okay, so what are you going to do as far as, because in order for an, a, dis a disinfectant to work correctly, you have to clean the surfaces first. Like that's the most effective thing you can do. So for me, like I can't picture somebody coming into the school and using a handheld machine, you know, in each classroom, you're still having to wipe down all the surfaces first. And then because you're layering it with a disinfectant, you're supposed to then wipe off all that as well. So to me, I'm thinking like, okay, so if you're wiping down surfaces, you know, that's one thing, but now all of that solution is getting inside carpet, it's getting inside books, it's getting inside anything that's porous, and I'm not sure how that's going to be cleaned. Like, that seems, that doesn't seem easier for me. So, I'm just curious how, like, I've missed board meetings, like, obviously, I think we're all more in tunes now, because and we should have always been in tune, but I think, of course, we're all more in tune, because it's just trying times, right? But I'm just, I'm not understanding, like, how did that get approved? And, you know, why are we thinking, like, $900 per school, like, that was something that, you know, why didn't we? This is a program that almost every school in the state is using, almost exactly the same program. This is not something we dreamt up by ourselves. This well, that doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's right. Like, just because all the other schools are doing it. Following CDC protocol. So if I go in and observe, I will watch that all the surfaces are going to be wiped off first, then the fogger is going to be used, and then you're going to clean all the surfaces. You'll do that three part. And the carpets and the books and all of the disinfectant that's going into all of the porous items. Is that what you're like? If I watch, because I'm, I should be able to allow, be able to watch it, right? Happen. 
once again, we're, we, are do, we are following accepted practices. The accepted practice for this particular program is there's no wiping down required after the disinfecting supplies. Okay, so if you could just pass on that information to me because CDC guidelines says the opposite of having to wipe down the surfaces after you use the solution. It, you know, if you're using on the kids' desks and now they're eating at their desks, like you're supposed to be wiping that off. So I would love to see that information. I think the public should be knowing that we are using these machines and I think it should just be known. Like, I feel like it's kind, it was kind of like put under the table quite a bit. Like it doesn't, it didn't seem like it was known. So I just wanted to make sure that anybody that was on the call tonight just knew about this new technology that the school is using. So, Jen, did you get the, um, the MSDS sheet that I sent you and Maria when you had questions about this? We've decided we're not going to call it the fogger anymore. The fogger is a bad term. It sounds like driving up bicycles behind the mosquito sprayer like when we were kids. It's not like that. It's a high-tech disinfectant solution. And when we train our custodians, we are going to train them, first and foremost, that we clean, then we disinfect. There may be a day that my classroom doesn't get the electrostatic sprayer, but all of the commonly touched surfaces will be cleaned and disinfected. So that deep cleaning day may be the day that we do more of the electrostatic sprayer. But um, I think, did you get the material that I sent you? Well, there were some, um, there were some different options you could use for this, for the, um, disinfectant sprayer so I wasn't a hundred percent sure which solution you went with it sounded like Bert, so Bert um, can you just guess gave me the name to it mean? I just to me I just feel like I just feel like um it's nonsensical like if it, if it, if if COVID lives in the air and we're wearing masks like to me opening up a window and wiping down surfaces is just as effective so I I just don't see how, you know, spraying disinfectants into our carpets and <laughs> books and, you know, and all of that. I just, I just personally, I just don't see that it makes sense. And I just think it's a conversation that should be had. Like, of course, COVID is very scary, but um, chemicals are very scary too. And our children absorb 50% more than we do. And so for them, to, and of course, because of the symptoms, that you know where um our children are now having to report you know if they have headaches and this and that just be cautious and be aware that if if you're using these machines um and you're not like waving down the surfaces but it's like in the air and it's in the carpets and it's in the classroom and that's the environment that they're in then just be very cautious that those symptoms like headaches and fatigue and all of those things might be heightened so um i you know i you know where i stand i think it's just an important conversation to Thanks, thank have. you for your input i think our public input session is kind of overgone its normal bounds but is there anybody else that has anything quickly I'd like to add Anybody? Okay. So, <laughs> okay. When I asked for discussion. I'm not sure we did. So, just for show of hands, all in favor of the minutes is posted. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that, Christina. Yeah. Aha. Yeah. Um, so, this surprise, you know, the next item is a discussion of reopening schools. And I think we I'm had sorry, a couple I'm of sorry. things left over Can from the minutes where Can we I interrupt for a second? Can you hear having me? some kind of a trigger. What's that? I'm sorry. Can I, have a, can I ask another question? We'll have a public input again. Um, if you just want to hang on, we'll have another oh. input that you can do. OK, great. That'd be awesome. Thanks. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was. Some thoughts in, in our last meeting, we're talking about having some kind of a way 
to trigger a pivot to um, remote learning. So I think it's imperative that we do address that and have something and have a plan rather than react. I listened to the headmaster of St. Johnsbury Academy this morning, and they're doing, um, of course, they're doing exactly what we're doing, although they're not taking Wednesday off, they're doing Friday off, which I think our plan actually makes more sense. And I know our, the plan that we're adopting isn't unique to us. I've, I've heard them being adopted all the way from Massachusetts. And north of us, I guess Lisbon's doing full reopening, and there's a lot of full reopening as we get more rural. Um, so I, I feel reasonably comfortable. I know there is there are possibilities of things going awry, and we need to be prepared to understand when something is going wrong with our plan and to have a plan in place to react to it. So I don't know if we need to do that now or. <clears throat> Yes, we had an administrative team meeting today and we've been talking about a matrix to be able to help with that decision making so that we're not really wondering. If we just listen to DHS guidance, they say if you have a positive case, call us immediately. We'll help you with the communication. And they'll decide, help us decide whether we can do contact tracing because students were really socially distant or whether a, a classroom or, or a group of students need to quarantine. Now that all sounds really good on paper um, or in a webinar, but the reality is if we have a, I believe, if we have a positive case in a classroom, we're gonna have to quarantine that classroom and possibly the school. Or well, there'll be no attendance the next day. So it really is up to us to make sense of the guidance. I think, you know, if you have a small school like some of the village schools around here, one case is enough to quarantine the school for two weeks. In a school this size, that may not be the case. Some districts are looking at a percent of what percent of the students present had a positive case or had a parent with a positive case. And then you can really work with DHHS to figure out if you, maybe it was one wing in this building where they had their own bathrooms, their own entrance, and they really didn't have common spaces. Um, you can also look at um, county numbers if the numbers in our county exceed 5% positive of those tested, a proactive measure would be to close the schools and, and go remote. Right now, I think we're under 1%. So you can look at numbers in a building this size. You can look at numbers in your geographical area and make some proactive decisions. And I think we err on the side of caution and you know, make the decision if, if there's a certain number in a school this size or a certain percent, we have to quarantine the building, do the deep cleaning, and then see if there are any other cases result. That's, I think, the most responsible thing to do. So I, when you speak of testing, I think it would behoove us to reach out to Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, Dartmouth Hitchcock turnaround on tests is somewhere between four and five hours. And um, I, I mean, I think Don pointed out or somebody that there were certain cases where it would take a week. And, and obviously that would be, it's not worth doing the tests if you're going to wait a week. But um, Dartmouth has offered to us as EMS providers to be considered employees down there. And if they say four to five hours is what we should expect. Um, and I don't know whether they might open that up. <clears throat> so it's worth a, it's worth an ask. I understand the state is probably going to pivot toward health centers for doing that testing anyway and get away from this network they've got. Well, because HCHS has this test app. If you're a member, you know, if you're a patient, you can take the test. So I would be reaching out. I think that's, yeah. And, and I, I think it's up to this board at this point to make a, some decisions about if there's a case in the school versus in the community. I personally don't have a problem with a case. There have been cases in the community where people came home from work, they've been sent home to quarantine, they went home in quarantine, they didn't get out in the public, they didn't expose themselves anywhere. That's still considered a case with the, uh, the state will still call that a case in our town. But that person didn't 
there's no exposure to that person. But the case of somebody in the school is entirely different in my view. I, I, that would throw up a red flag to me. And I, uh, so I, I think the board needs to weigh in on that particular aspect of it. Do you agree? <laughs> Sort of following up on this your question, I had a, a lot of questions that occurred to me that I'll just go through them briefly. Um, what happens if six children are sent to the nurse at the same time or within the same hour? Where do they go if they have to be quarantined from the school? Do they have to stay 25 feet apart or just distance for sneezing and coughing droplets? Who watches the isolated children? What happens if parents cannot pick up their child for two or three hours? What happens if a child tests positive for COVID? Does the entire class plus the teacher have to quarantine for 14 days or be tested? What happens if the children cannot stay home alone because there was no pre-planning for a sudden expulsion from school? What happens if the children cannot learn the curriculum <clears throat> in 40% of the time allowed as contemplated by the hybrid system? What happens if the nurse gets sick? Who will replace her? Does the entire school shut down? If not, why not? What happens if a teacher coughs or sneezes and has to stay out for 14 days to get tested, which currently takes seven to 14 days? What happens if two teachers in the same grade get sick? Does that grade have to shut down? What happens if one, two, or three, or four children get COVID in the school or in the community? How do parents react when the school is shut down for 14 days on less than 24 hours notice? <clears throat> Going back to whether we should do the hybrid system or not, why can't we do a full remote learning live stream five days a week during regular school hours with only the teacher being broadcast to the students, with students only interacting with teachers in separate conference rooms, which can be done on Zoom? Why can't we have five or six children in a class pod with one parent supervising the children in one class while the teacher teaches? This will help to address the parents being able to go to work Right now, as I understand it, children are going to be home three days out of five. This would mean that parents would have to make arrangements for the children three days out of five, whereas if we had pods of five or six kids in a class, they could miss work only one day a week. Don't class pods in parents' homes solve the problem of socialization needs of the children if they weren't going to school, especially if they're with their friends, which is probably likely. Doesn't that solve the problem of parents going to work for at least four out of five weekdays instead of two out of five weekdays? Why can't we send food to each class pod for breakfast and lunch or provide food to be prepared by the supervising parent? Why can't we as a community work together for 60 school days, which is my proposal, to see what happens with other schools that go live to learn <clears throat> from their triumphs and tragedies before we put our students, teachers and nurses, janitors and committee members at risk. And finally, aren't there too many unknowns to proceed to live classroom teaching to any extent? Aren't there too many foreseeable problems to think that a hybrid program will be stable and successful in teaching the children what they need to know <clears throat> in a stable environment, not subject to sudden stopping, allow the children to socialize with each other on a daily basis, allow the children to be properly supervised and kept on task by a supervising parent and keep the children adequately fed and safe in an environment, <clears throat> in, in as safe of an environment as possible. So I throw that out there. I, I think we're trying to address the problems. One of the things I was very pleased about last meeting was that although we all have strong opinions on this, it's we're all maintaining our composure and um, carrying out in good faith, which I think we should continue to do tonight. Thank you. So the question was, I think the question I asked was about uh, what do we do if we have a case? Is that, was that the question? Okay. Um, so does anybody have a thought? Is that the one that came through this afternoon? I couldn't open it. I was trying to do it on my phone and it wouldn't work. So that question, what happens if one or two or three or four students get COVID was just what we just started to talk about. Uh, do we shut the school down suddenly? I would say with four, absolutely. 
Um, again, DHHS guidance requires us to call them immediately and they will help us process the situation and work on communication plans and contact tracing. But local control means that we can set the metric. Um, for example, are we going to use a percentage of those students that are physically in the school? Or are we going to develop the matrix for uh, what we think is right and say, like right now we have less than 1% individuals testing positive. Um, some areas suggest going remote proactively if your county gets to be above 5%, which is way more than where we are now. And let's just agree, none of this is great. We are not where we were last year coming back to school. We are in a very different place trying to make sense of the, of the data and not uh, being concerned and being prog progressive, the active and planning. Um, but there are, there are no guarantees. We think that we have plans that will, will work. Um, and if, if the decision is if we have one case in the school, we close for two weeks to quarantine, students would, would have remote instruction, and then we'd see if anybody develops any more symptoms. At that point, we'd have to have a, a, a re-entry plan. Are we going to re-enter the same way? Or are we just going to bring back the young kids and anybody that needs um, you know, some additional services? You could continue remote after those two weeks, but bringing, bringing the young kids who really need to be in school. I wasn't quite sure, Don, about your pod. Did you get my response to your questions? Just, can, just this afternoon, we sent that, I sent that email out so that, and I'm happy to post these with the answers that, because part of the FAQ, I've been trying to answer as many questions as we can with the best information we have, and then post them places so people can all, you know, read and um, probably generate more questions. I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in, but I'll, I'm not afraid to offer an opinion on my thoughts anyway, is that if we get a student in this building that is in this building and positive, I, I would say that we would close this building down. And depending on how they got to this building, if they came on the bus, then we have to even consider going beyond them. They came with mom and dad and they have no, no brothers or sisters at home, then maybe I could see just the one school. That, that's that's just me talking. I'm one of seven, so. Yes, that's, that, it, I would want to pull out all the stops if we had a, a positive case. The community, and, and I'm, I'm knocking wood here when I say it, but we, I haven't seen a case yet. And, and the hospital hasn't seen a case yet. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping the community holds on to that, but. There's no guarantees. We all understand there's a risk. Small, small though it is, and they talk about small percentages, and we're way below all the percentage numbers that they, they give us for guidance. So I, um, and I'm still mindful of Linda Haggerty talking about kids coming to school <coughs> and doing that, because that's a common thing in the fall, I guess. And I'm not sure if the smaller classrooms in isolation will help stop that or prevent that, I'm not really clear. Actually, I meant to reach out to Sarah Youngshu and see if I can get some guidance on that, and I didn't have time this afternoon. Okay. Don't send kids a headache email, something like this. Don't send a kids that typically have allergies and then have little nipples. Like it's a known condition. This is supposed to be new, new symptoms that students never really had before related to allergies or migraines. Um, and, and that cough of mine is because I'm allergic to my dog. The dog Stan. <laughs> Zyrtec works reasonably well. So I think I, so I agree with Dick, except what I'd like to say is from exposure to symptoms could be anywhere between two and 14 days is my understanding with five to six day average. So I'd be concerned if we have a student in this building with siblings and other buildings, and if they've been out in the community or if they've played sports um, or they've been in interactive activities after school programs on the bus. 
So I think it's a case by case scenario for me, depending on how much exposure to other schools that they've had. I um, mean, we do have some students that attend like sixth or seventh graders that attend the middle school here from Bath that could potentially expose the Bath Elementary School as well. So I want to consider that exposure and not just consider isolation in this building, but also with the quarantine across the SU, if there's a chance that those students could expose each other. I guess my thought is, is that, I mean, all the kids that are going to get their temperature checked before they enter school, they're all going to be asked questions, make sure that they don't have that. So in a good theory that we're allowing these kids to pass, like we did here, we're all here because we, our temperature met the requirements and everything else. Um, so if that student goes to that classroom and that student happens to end up um, getting COVID, um, I think of like the 15 minute test, I think it would be wise just to send that whole classroom of 10 people or 11 um, to go get a test to, uh, to make sure um, because the kids aren't going to be roaming around. They're going to come in, they're going to go to their classroom where they're supposed to be. Um, lunch is going to be delivered to them. So as far as, um, you know, and like Sabrina said, if they play athletic sports, then you know, if it's a 15 minute or, you know, a four or five hour return, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good answer in a short amount of time as far as the, you know, the, the rest of the people go. So I'm going to just piggyback on that. So it's my understanding based on the last meeting from one of our nurses that only 40% of our students or 40% of the population actually has a fever if they're tested positive for COVID. Did, ever, did anybody else hear that? I wrote that in my notes. So I just want to be cautious that it's not just necessarily the fever piece. Um, and we shouldn't really rely on just those questions and the temperature. While I don't think we should return to school, as I've made clear, I do think a trigger would make sense. I think a simple trigger would be make the most sense. And I'm in favor of testing all the students before they come to school, as well as teachers and administration. Um, I don't know how complicated that would be, but if you had an asymptomatic child or two or three coming to the school and they already have it, it's going to be a disaster. Can we look into that? Uh, we can. I, I just want to comment on, on Chuck's idea that if somebody is test positive in the classroom, just have everybody test, and if they test negative, they can come back. And our guidance for our document um, is that even if you, you have to wait at least 10 days since that person first developed symptoms, because students can continue to develop symptoms for, just get tested. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. I, okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Perfect. Thanks, Jack. No? No? This is a rugged microphone. We could throw it. <laughs> yes. negative but two or three days later they may test positive because they haven't developed enough symptoms so unless we were to test students on a regular occurrence or regular basis i don't think it that would be worth testing because if we were to test them now most likely everyone is going to test negative until someone is exposed so i would want to test them we were to go to a regular basis that's, that's a, I think we need to understand what's involved in testing. Right, which is what I was saying. I don't know how complicated it would be. I agree with you, Sabrina. Um, it's not a guarantee, but at least we'd start out clean. That's my thinking. And I don't know how practical or impractical it would be to have testing every week. I, I just don't see that as a possibility. But at least we could start out with everybody having a clean test at certain intervals before school starts. I'm thinking two days before school. I'm prepared for yeah, just say, my, 
if the if it's the conventional test we're talking about, where you put the cut the swab up and, and touch the back of your brain, I think we're going to have a lot of pushback on that being a, a, a weekly event. Yeah. Go ahead. I would go out on a limb and say yes, and we did get some federal funding to assist us through the COVID issues. So I would think that, you know, I'm kind of speaking from, for the board without us actually, but I, the money is there. It's been given to us to do this kind of thing. So I would presume we could. Purchasing some tests. I don't know much about it, but since it's a lottery, you're selling, you're going to look more into it. Okay. Have you reached out to Cottage to see if they could help you with that? Any part of the testing that you need help with? Well, I mean, they used to provide our nurses. So I don't think they'd, they have Oc Health and, and so on. And yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if they would get in their car and drive over. But I mean, I just wondered if we asked. Okay. Well, I, if, somebody wouldn't mind just reaching out and having a discussion with them. Karen Woods would might be a good contact person. She's uh, kind of runs the show there. So yeah, I, I don't want to speak for them, but it's, a, it's just a question. Anybody else have any thoughts? Really? What else do we need to cover over on this topic that we haven't? There were a couple of things at the last meeting that we were still digging into. So I'd like um, Mr. Ross and Mr. Phillips to be able to talk about the data they got from, from the middle school that was fourth and fifth grade parents to see whether we could do more remote class for those that wanted remote and um, the four days in school for those that wanted face to face. And Mr. Ross to talk about his um, surveys for parents. So we could wait for administrative reports, but our reports are really about this topic. So um, jump in there. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, just wanted to share with you, we have surveyed parents several times and uh, reaching out to get a sense for what it is that they're interested for the model of education. And uh, as of last Friday, they had 50 responses from um, approximately 90 parents in fourth and fifth grade. So last week, Ms. Newton surveyed parents once again with some further questions and laid out some options uh, to get a sense for what parents were interested in. And I wish we had more responses. To be honest, we heard from 60% of the parents and you know we want to be able to accommodate needs while keeping social distance norms acceptable in the classrooms. And our plan is, you know, particularly looking at fourth and fifth grade, we have 91 students and we've heard from about 60, 60 parents right now. So our plan tomorrow is to email those parents and or call them specifically with a variety of options. 
that range from face-to-face -face instruction, um, hybrid instruction, uh, VLAX, or remote learning. And I think when we have those numbers, it'll determine which model that we follow, uh, whether we go with teach, two teachers teaching remote, or do we have to look at a combination of four or five? But we really want to look at what those numbers dictate and present an option that works um, for the kids, maintain social distance, and for the families as well. Um, six, seven, and eight is uh, quite a bit clearer as uh, we didn't have as wide a range of options, but we're, we're still shy a number of respondents, but we want to chase those down tomorrow. Any questions about that? So my question would be, uh, we, we don't know how many parents are going to be sending their kids to school until we do this survey, is that right? We know how many students we have enrolled, particularly if we look in fourth and fifth grade, we have 91 students enrolled. The question is, how do we serve those students? Do we do it off-site and do it remote, or do we do it face-to-face -face with teachers? And that's what we, we're still lacking a response from about 30% of parents. So we'll pick up the phone and call them. The issue was we were gonna have a percentage of the students remote only, and we were gonna have, initially we thought we had three teachers per grade. We were gonna have one teacher do remote, the other two in class. That was the original concept. And what you're trying to do is fine tune the numbers to see who, who wants to be in which group. That's, that's all we're doing. So um, we sent out a, a survey that was directed specifically at options that the, the families could choose from, meaning they could choose face-to-face -face instruction in school, uh, a re remote learning, a v the VLAX option, and homeschooling. And we have received, I think we're down to six kids we have not heard from. Uh, and Sheila Brill did an awesome job of contacting parents and really following up on that. So we have pretty accurate numbers, we think. Um, and we're looking at, in third grade, we could put uh, very comfortably, we can have uh, two in-school uh, classes and one remote. Uh, second grade, we can have two in-class um, instructions with a small remote class. They have a smaller number of students. Um, so we had planned, if this was a normal year, we had planned to go to four first grades, which has a larger number and keep two second grades. Um, so the, the first grade number dictates three in-school classes in terms of size-wise, and then a small uh, remote learning class. So we're looking at the potential of having a, a remote learning class that has a one-two uh, combination. They're small numbers. And in kindergarten, we have enough, again, to have two smaller uh, in-school um, instruction in one remote. Interesting, interesting is the, the, the in-school would be around eight or nine kids at this point. We're still doing our kindergarten registration, uh, but our, out, our, our remote is already up to 13, so the remote class would actually be larger than the in-school classes, uh, though well below the number that we had we posted. So, um, and uh, the preschool, we're still working on some numbers on that also. We have some parents that wish to have remote, uh, though we're looking at our staffing situation on that to see if we can actually offer the remote. But we want to know where the parents are feeling right now before we, we're fine tuning our numbers. And uh, we're, we're working on our plan every day. So, questions, screen, screen on. It, it's what, what's the percentage of remote versus in school? 
and I combine the VLAX and the remote learning. So, and it comes out to um, about 50-50, and it actually is a little bit higher on the remote and VLAX combination uh, end of things, and a small number of homeschooled, maybe three or four. Did I miss anybody? What's that? Oh. <laughs> Who am I getting this to? <laughs> All right. All right. So I sent out a survey on Friday as well, um, based on the last board meeting with the options were which do you, which uh, model do you plan to pursue for your student? Is it the hybrid model? Is it a VLAX or some other remote platform? Um, we don't have the option at the high school to offer remote from our, our school. And um, the third was homeschooling. I received 107 responses out of 215 students. Um, 94 of those were indicated that they were pursuing the hybrid model. There were 11 for VLAX and four for homeschooling. Back down the remaining. Out again. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I know. I know. A lot of people are not terribly responsive to things like that. There you go. Eric, you mentioned that you don't have the option of remote learning from the high school? Not in the same way that you have it in an elementary school. Um, say my, my math teacher, say Jamie Mullen, he teaches, he teaches six distinct classes uh, in our, and all of our teachers are assigned that way. It's not like any of them just teach ninth grade or just teach 10th grade and you can put two in class and one remote. They're all very distinct. And, and in some cases like science, they're also very distinct certifications. You have to be certified in that area to be able to teach that class. Anybody else? Okay, so we've heard from all the administrators on where they are at their schools. Anything else we want to cover on this topic? So we, we do need to work on the, the trigger. We have heard uh, that statewide VLAX is um, developing a wait list for certain grades. I heard that the younger grades, K1, 2, still had openings. 4, 5 had some wait lists. Um, they had so many people register that they're busy trying to do some hiring. And if anybody is interested in that, they should really put in an application so that they get on, they get on the list. They're really looking to see how many people are serious because they don't want to hire if they're not going to have that many students. Um, but I'm told they will hire if you know they have firm commitment to people. Who are they going to hire? I mean, aren't there, is there a, a, a pool of teachers out there capable of just waiting for them to call? Anywhere in the world. Oh, good point. I guess it'd be nice if they spoke English, I suppose. Anything? Anybody else? All right. Um, do we need to go through any more administrative reports? We didn't really. Um, I, I just wanted to add one thing. I heard today that the state is going to provide uh, face, you know, reusable face coverings for, for our students. We'll get, we'll get those based on our free and reduced lunch numbers. Um, Saturday was graduation at Woodsville High School. Fortunately, Mother Nature cooperated and we had a sunny day. It was raining when I left my house. I was really concerned. Um, I, it was just made me proud to be there and to hand out diplomas. And um, for some of the kids I've known since second grade, and um, it was it was a wonderful day. It wasn't the total traditional, but I think uh, Mr. Chase and Mr. Strau and um, 
all those that were able to, to help out at the high school. Um, they, they did a wonderful job. I had some great feedback from parents just saying to thank everybody. They know it was how important it was for these kids to be able to be together as a class and to go through the graduation. So we did not broadcast it. It was, um, and it, yeah. And I believe they, I believe they archived it. Uh, and then a couple of us attended a webinar with our uh, attorneys, Drummond and Woodson, and they were doing an informational um, session to just help us process some of the requests that we've had for either um, uh, an alternative um, work environment based on different situations. So it was, it was very informative, very helpful, and um, we'll work on gathering some information to be able to share with all employees so that they're aware of you know what some of the benefits are that are available during these emergency times. So all I have. And there is for the school board members if you haven't signed up, I did sign up to attend the webinar on I think it's next Tuesday, the 18th, about uh, reopening and communication issues related to that. I believe is the topic. Uh, so I guess. Unless any other administrative reports that I'm not aware of. Kathy, you're good. Hi. <laughs> She's okay. Um, so there we are. Item seven on the agenda, administrative administration of federal grant funds, first reading. I don't know if everybody on the board was able to wade through it. I found it to be absolutely fascinating reading. I couldn't put it down. All right, that might be a little, you can't see my nose grow because of the uh, mask, I hope. I did, I was interested in, in, after reading a little of it, and then I found a couple of spots where they're talking about, they consider $250,000 kind of a cutoff before they bother with some stuff. And, I'm like, and then they call uh, $10,000 a micro purchase. So I can see they're coming from a different world. You, you want to? You want to speak to it at all? Yeah. <laughs> so we had an audit in March, um, and they just came back and said that we were missing a few policies regarding our federal grant. Um, and so they actually were kind enough to, um, they were all done so nicely with the school board association. So we pretty much took them from there. So it's policy DAF, but they're within their, their subcategories or sub policies, one, three, five, and nine or whatever um, that were required from that audit. So um, we're doing it for all our boards and we'll make sure we're on, on task. So. Thank you. So Sabrina makes a motion to accept this item. <laughs> John seconds DAF for first reading. Anyone have any discussion? If not, we'll bring it to a vote. On you have discussion. I I took a quick look at it and I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. And I read for a living. So could we task somebody other than me? <clears throat> with reading it and summarizing it because it just looks like a bunch of gobbledygook to me. Maybe we could have Lori do that. <laughs> so this is a government supplied form. And, and it's sort of like, if you want our money, you're gonna do this kind of thing. And it, 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 speak up if I'm wrong with it. So um, if- And I think the, when I read the audit, the last business on the audit, they mentioned a lot of the same stuff and it was equally fascinating, I assure you. Um, I, if the board wants to expend some funds to have somebody read it and summarize it, speak up. I, well, I'm understanding you, Lord. Basically, this is the requirements to get federal funding. And and we already and we already we already do those things. When, 
Okay, so is there going to be a list of what we're going to do with it before we vote on it? Um, all it is, it, tell me if, if I'm wrong, it, it's instructions on how we are supposed to handle the money and account for the money. And um, we can't, you know, we have to guarantee that there's no improprieties. And every, every item in there makes sense, but it's so, so tedious. The tedium is just off the chart. Um, but there wasn't anything I found in there that I haven't seen in other municipal crap. Sorry, you can't say that. I'm sorry, Ron. <laughs> okay, I just want to clarify. Item one funds are all teachers. Some of it comes from the general fund, but all of the money for Title I goes to Title I teachers. Title II is professional development funds. So when we find out how much money they're going to give us, we talk to the principals based on the annual learning goals and what are the priorities for training, it's all training. And then Title IV can be technology or wellness. Uh, so there's very specific kinds of things that we can use to spend the money on. But once we apply for it, receive it, these are the things that we have to have the internal controls to be compliant. Yeah, there's a ton of red tape. Yeah, we do. Um, so, any other comments before we vote on this? Accepting it as a first reading, it's not an adoption. Um, all in favor of accepting this as a first reading? Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? There you have it. Any nominations or resignations tonight? We did just learn of one resignation. Unfortunately, Erica Tierney, um, our, our substance prevention counselor, our SAP, uh, is resigning her position. That's a three day a week position that we've had. And Erica's been wonderful. She'll be missed. So I recommend you accept her resignation with regret. I always enjoy this, this little debate about whether we accept them or not. But uh, Okay, so. Um, somebody want to make a motion to accept it with thank you? Chuck, anyone second? Don, thank you. So, um, that one resignation, all in favor, aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? I'll abstain. I just always think that's a silly episode. A event to take place. You know, you're right. Didn't we do that? Yeah. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Do you want to make the motion again? That, that we don't have. <laughs> that we don't have to accept resignation. Yeah. We make motion we don't have to vote on to accept resignation. Going forward, check seconds that. Any debate and discussion? Tried that in the past. Well, all right, so John made the motion, seconded by Chuck. All in favor? Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay. Carries. Any other business tonight? John? Yeah, sure. Right in there. Yeah. No, I, I just want, you know, a lot of has been going on. I just wanted to thank Lori and her administrators and all the staff that have been helping her um, navigate through these tumultuous times. I mean, it's been a tremendous amount of work and hours spent. And I just want my, you know, we appreciate all your hard work and everybody's hard work that's been involved in this. Um, you know, it's extremely difficult times. And, you know, uh, just want to thank everyone. Thanks. Job now. Good job. Um, public input. Oh yeah, I promised we'd still have some public input. Nancy, would you like to start that? <laughs> that one's still pretty wet. 
Okay, I have been working here. This is my 36th year. This is my first year as the president of the Haverhill Education Teachers Association. And I would be, if I did not speak, I would not be able to live with myself. We repolled our teachers, we served our teachers, surveyed them after the board accepted going hybrid and option. 67.5% of teachers that were surveyed by these members, they felt that remote was the best option after reading all of the symptom management, the protocols that need to be in place. 75% are not comfortable knowing the symptom management and the exposure protocol and everything that is now going to be expected of them. We're not ready to open our doors. We've worked very hard. I will say I've been on two committees. We have worked very hard to try to come up with plans that will help parents, will have students back face to face as we know is the best way to teach. But we don't have details. The devil's in the details, as they say. We don't know even how kids are being dropped off, how they're being picked up, where they're going, if they're in isolation. And now I'm hearing that some teachers are going to be doing a combination class. I've done a combination class in person. It's wonderful. But now you're thinking that you're going to have teachers do a combination class remotely. We have two weeks before our teachers are back in school. Three weeks before our students walk in. If you know teachers, if you have teachers in your family, you know when August 1st hits, their mind's on school. They're planning. They're getting their rooms ready. They're doing school stuff. We don't know what we're doing. We're stressed beyond belief. We understand the need for students to be back, but we need details to these plans. Classrooms aren't ready. Furniture, all furniture that is not essential is being moved out of our classrooms. Some floors aren't waxed yet. When are we getting in to work and set up our classrooms to be ready? You don't do that in two days. It takes a very long time. We haven't been able to send out letters because we don't know who's in our class. We beseech you to delay opening or to start remote. See how it goes. And after that, we'll be working on the details to all of these plans. But I'm afraid if we open those doors in three weeks, we're not going to know. We're going to be struggling to figure out the details that we need to have written down. We need to have things that are similar across the board in all our buildings. I'm not sure if we do. So I'm asking you for teachers who want to do the best by parents and by students to start off going remote or at the very least delay opening. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Greta Smith and I teach fifth grade here at the middle school. This will be my 28th year in this building. It will be my 35th year meeting a class. I have been struggling with this for months, just like every other teacher in the country. I spent more than 50 hours in professional development this summer that had to do with all the content areas, but repeatedly conversations came up around what are we doing to start school. As you all know, that there has been large groups of people that have been doing amazing work. And for that, I am personally and professionally grateful for all of the efforts that everyone is putting in. But as we begin to look at this, 
in some of my workshops and conferences that I've attended this summer, the conversation came up repeatedly that says, getting back to normal is a farce. Our normal is gone. We have to figure out how to make this work. And one of the conversations that's happened is that the more that we continue to ask our parents, the more stress we're putting on our parents, the more their anxiety is rising because we are trying to tell them how much we care about their children. And yet with every survey, with every letter that goes home, with every communication, what they're hearing is that we don't know, and they are right. We don't know. There have been some amazing ideas that came out of this conversation tonight alone, but we can't act upon them because just as Nancy said, there is no time left. This isn't a game, and I know that you understand that, but I'm asking, what is our rush to start school according to the calendar. One of the conversations we were able to have with numerous experts from across the country is that now is the time that we can change that calendar. The calendar has been the same since I got here. It changes a day or two here and there and we add a group where we take out a professional development but the calendar starts just before Labor Day and it ends in mid-June. There are groups of people and districts this year that have decided that they are going to wait and start school at the end of September, where hopefully our Indian summer is done, which may alleviate some of the concerns about the fact that every one of us who's ever been in a classroom knows we're all sick in the middle of September. We've all got colds, everybody's allergies are acting up. So they're choosing to alleviate that. I'm asking for us to answer the question, why are we rushing? We don't have the time to do everything that we feel is right. Any one of us across the country would rather be in a classroom with our children to see the excitement, to be a part of the new year of learning, to have time to get to know our children. But what we keep hearing is, where are they going to be academically? What's going to happen? We're not going to know, ladies and gentlemen, the answers to those questions for generations. We're not going to know. We certainly can't answer them here, and we certainly can't answer them now. But God forbid that we have just one child who develops COVID-19 or a family member that develops this virus, and God forbid that they should die because what will happen to every teacher in this, in this area is that they will beat themselves up mercilessly, that they didn't do enough, that they should have done something different. So please help me understand why we are in such a rush. Thank you for your time. You like to respond to that? No, I mean, I think that the details, the details are, we have them. We just had to figure out what the, what the models were gonna be and, and the community wanted to have choice. So trying to, it takes time to figure out choices and can we support it and do we have the staff and will there be general equity? I think, you know, how kids are gonna enter the building and leave the building are, are crystal clear. The question about, you know, the calendar and when do we start? We started advocating for more time back in June. We came to the boards and said, 
two days to get ready for school is never enough on a good year. It's certainly not going to be enough this year. And our boards were very generous all across the SDU, and they approved three more days so that would have a week. But as it gets closer, we're hearing schools, I mean, all of Vermont starts after Labor Day, right, Sabrina? And there are some New Hampshire schools that are starting uh, after, after Labor Day. And it came up today whether, you know, we, we should ask the board to do that. And, you know, the high school trying to figure out how to get through running start courses already being days behind would be a bit of a challenge. Um, and I asked Eric, you know, would high school teachers mind if they started on that day because they have to get started, but K to eight would have an additional time to orient teachers and I mean parents and orient kids into really preparing, get ready. I would have no problem asking the board if they would consider starting after Labor Day, but I didn't write a report, I didn't ask that, and I really feel like I'm, I'm springing it on them. We could make really good use of the time, um, even if it's not the whole week. But if they, spend, if they spend the week doing training and getting reopening plans ready, you still have to pass out computers, you still have to bring young kids in, you still have to help them figure out what the, what the learning management system is. And what we learned last year was that we have parents that really need to have some, some not training, but some understanding, better understanding of, of how Google Classroom use, it works or how the Seesaw program works or how to upload and, um, kids' finished work so that we're dealing less with papers. So, I mean, I, I, I would support another delay. At some point, it's not a rush. We do need to start with the model that was approved. So just for clarification, are you advocating for a... September 8th start date then? I would support that. Great. I'll make a motion that we have a September 8th start date. I've always supported a Labor Day, you know, post Labor Day start date for schools. I have no problem with that. For across the board, that's what you're advocating for. Well, that's up to the other. Just right. but it, would, it would be difficult to advocate for a delayed start for K to 8 and not have that opportunity for high school as well. So as difficult as it will be for teachers to have less time, oh, I, I, think it, I think it should be K to 12. So, so the motion is made and seconded, but let's have a good discussion here so we understand. First of all, Nancy, to your point, um, you're concerned about details. Can you, I know we meet on Wednesday, can you make a list of details that you're concerned about? Tell us, tell us the kinds of things that you, Just, just make sure there's a communication. Everybody understands what you need to know. It would be helpful. So, yeah, she can email that around to you. We can put it on. In their sure. So we can just make the decisions and say, here we go. But as the principals try to include teachers, it takes longer. It takes longer to build consensus, but we also feel like it helps build understanding and support for the decisions that are made. When is, the, when is the September school board meeting? September 14th. And, and the motion is to ex extend the beginning of school to September 8th? Well, my only, my only thinking is that <clears throat> If we start a little bit late, we'll be able to see what happens in the rest of the state and 
react if we need to, but if we have to go back to school before the next school board meeting, then we'd lose that opportunity. Okay. It's easy for us to change our date. Well, there you go. Uh, Nancy, can you tell me, based on the percentages, how many staff we have total in the SC or in the Haverhill School Board District, and how many teachers took the survey? Do you know how many took the survey? Forty. Lori, can you? So, so did only union members take the survey, or did all? Okay, so how many union members are there? 40, so then how many? So 100% of the teachers took the survey. That's what I wanted to, okay, thank you. When is tentatively right now, based on our calendar, when is, when does in-service start? I don't have a calendar on me. And if we were to push out school through the eight, could we get an exemption to count those days or not count those days through the governor's order? So when you say the second week, are you thinking the first week in September? Or, so the first week in September, how would you see that if we were counting as student days then? Right. Okay. So you're still saying that students would be active that week? Not as much as the week would be after, but they'd be getting So the schools would be open for students to access. Sounds like as a come and go to prepare for school. And then what does and then what does that do for the high school with the running start in the college classes? Well they're accustomed to having ninety days to get through their uh curriculum. And that that is running directly through Okay, so I need more comment on the motion on the floor. But, all right, so we're talking about September 8th opening to, to delay it until September 8th. Uh, it's partially related, but I, I wanted people to know that those questions that I talked about this morning or this evening, I just sent those to the school board on Friday. So the fact that Lori has already answered them Monday after she's getting back from vacation is a very quick turnaround. I just wanted people to understand that. Thank you, sir. Um, so to the article, anybody, any more discussion on the article? All in favor of August, uh, sorry, September 8th. Anyone opposed or abstaining? We're abstaining, and Dylan also. Okay. So the motion carries. Oh, there you go. Um, I think we are 
through other business. Public input is where we're at. Was there any more public input that we anybody can tell? I believe it looks like uh, uh, Ms. Robinson has one. Okay. That doesn't look like Ashley. I know her fairly well. Looks like Dave to me. But. Hello. Oh. Where is he? You've lost him. Hold on a sec. I lost you, Dave. There you go. Hi there. Um, I just had a question. It was actually it was raised my hand before, but I know you guys have voted on this already. But um, I, my question was, you discussed something that would uh, be on the calendar that would kind of rush the high school needing to restart. One of the things I know some districts are doing are actually even moving to the 14th, partially because it's not coming off a holiday week. Um, also, because it gives teachers a little bit extra time uh, to prepare. Um, it would also potentially allow the board to have a meeting in September, maybe the first week of September, um, and discuss what other what's going on with other districts and allow um, for a little more discussion before that first day um, to see how the guidance is going, if teachers have final questions. Um, I, I, I know the eighth is, that's, a, that's definitely great. I would be, wonder how the teachers in the room feel about even an extra week. And I know, I don't know what that does to an exemption from the governor on those days and what that does um, for the school calendar as a whole. But that date to me, I've seen from uh, multiple friends who have in within um, districts within the state of New Hampshire. Um, and I think that's part of the reason they're using that particular date. It also starts on a Monday. Um, uh, and with this, this calendar being a little different, um, maybe it would be a little more efficient. Um, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, you know, I know you guys have already voted on it, but uh, I just was curious what maybe the teachers in the room thought about that. I want to make sure um, that obviously, you know, my daughter's teachers have the time that they need um, and that everyone has the time that they need um, to, to restart this correctly and, and do it in the, in the safest way possible. And also in the most efficient way possible for the kids to have the best education. So that's it. Thank you, Dave. I'm not sure if I can add to that as well. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So I know that Lori had already mentioned about VLACs. Um, that's my only option for my son. We're a high risk family and we need to choose remote, which is a very difficult decision for, for me, I think, just because everything that's familiar for my son, the staff, the counselors, the teachers, his peers, you know, now he has none of that. So if I get a little teary while I'm talking, um, that's, that's why. Um, and I think at the, stand, at the standpoint, I mean, what you're going to find is that children who are enrolled in VLACs are getting a very late start because today I just finalized up Wyatt for his courses and they're saying that I may not even get a call back until October. So here I am with my second grader who's starting, well, now September 8th, which might make things a little easier at home, but I have a student now in second grade who's having to start her schooling, you know, much earlier than her older brother who are now like, well, that's not fair. Why is that one in school? And we're not about, I get it, like, it's not about fair right now, but I just, while we're talking about dates, maybe perhaps just put that in our thought process, the fact that VLAX is seeing a huge increase in enrollment right now. And that to me um, puts on some anxiety hearing that I may not even get a call back until October. And just because I'm, I'm sharing right now, and I don't, I don't want to get the conversation negative, but Dick, you had mentioned something about the VLAX um, instructors and hopefully that they speak English. And I thought that was so rude. Like I am like a parent right now who's really, really struggling. And I am so sad for my son right now that he's not gonna have, you know, his, right. his school family. Like he's not gonna have that. And the want, fact that you're throwing you out you those rude comments, that is a very rude comment. And you should take ownership of that because it's being talked about 
and it was rude and it's not okay. Somebody Thank know you. the answer to that question? I believe you have Maria McIntyre. Pardon? Somebody else? Yep, um, I have one more comment. So um, thank you, everybody. Oh my gosh. So um, I would like to know if Don's questions, his what if questions, because I wrote a bunch of those too. So I was wondering if he, if his what if questions are going to be answered. And I think Lori kind of, kind of answered it in her matrix answer, which was really cool. Like, what if this happens, this will happen. And then Dick said, you know, if one child is in one building that tests positive, you know, you're going to pull out all the stops. That was great to hear. And I'm just wondering if there's a committee <laughs> signed up to, to mitigate all that and to have it in public policy, because I think the organization piece of this is going to calm a lot of people's nerves. And I think that you're almost there, but we just need to see it. And then one more point is that we, again, we're not listening to the experts. Those teachers want to go back. They want to see their kids. They're saying not a week. No, not after Labor Day or whatever. No, a month. Okay, that's, that's, I don't think anybody heard that except me and the teachers and the nurses. So um, I really appreciate Lori's explanation and all the little gate. You know, you close the school down in a, in a week when this happened. Why not a month? I mean, seriously. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you all. Nobody, nobody hey, uh, did, okay. quick question. Quick okay. question. Sorry. Uh, this is Paul Hayes from the Caledonian Record. I just want to know if his video is going to be posted and when. That's all. Paul Hayes from the Caledonian Record wants to know if the video is posted of this. The plan is to record, convert the recording, and then post it to YouTube tomorrow if everything goes according to plan. According to plan, tomorrow it'll be posted to YouTube. Does that help you, sir? It does. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's stay now. You may. This one's getting back to help you <laughs> Um, so my question is related to um, logistics of teachers' responsibilities um, in classrooms with students without masks. So I'm actually looking to get answers from administration. So um, in any of the um, sending schools, the elementary and middle school, are teachers going to be required to be present in classrooms with students at any time not wearing a mask? Okay, that's my question. Thank you. What's that? No, it actually came up as a dress code question earlier. I don't really see it as a dress code. It's just a required mitigation strategy um, that we believe has the most impact on keeping the virus out of our school. So should teachers at the high school be asked then to supervise students at lunchtime in their personal classrooms with masks? So that's a really good question because we want to give kids the opportunity to eat without a mask on, right? Um, I thought you meant a student that arrives for the day without the mask will not be sitting in your classroom. Well, the lunches might be in daycare and the classes are long, but from what I understand, um, teachers are required to be present at lunchtime. Well, the person who knows me, I love kids in my classroom at lunch. I have had kids in my classroom at lunch every year that I have taught here at the school. <laughs> To have a group of kids with me every day without a mask on when there's a deadly virus in front of my house is terrifying. Especially right. not just myself, but my husband will also be with me every single day. So I think Mr. Chase said today that, you know, while at first we thought we can't use the cafeteria, we're going to have kids eat in their classrooms. And yes, they will take their masks off to ha have a drink of water or to um, eat lunch or to have a snack, but then put the mask back on. Um, I think he was talking about looking at scheduling some options in the cafeteria, um, kind of cut down on the cleaning in the classroom and um, Yeah. 
Right, I know, I know. Hopefully they'll, I know, I agree. If Don had gotten on the stick sooner, we would have the outside space all done by now. I know you're smiling, I saw that. It, it is a good idea. I don't know why. I see no reason why you couldn't go outside we, during the good weather. And, yeah. So we had some tables out front at one time. We had like four. They're, they're still there. Um, so we, oh. But we're good now. For, you know, construction, I think, is over. Last I heard, anyway. Mr. Phillips. Yeah, ta tables seem to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good idea. It, it's a it's a great concern. I, I understand, and it seems like some combination of classroom and cafeteria that should be able to figure something out. And got some folks here that should be able to do that. Anybody else? I wanted to say that I'm, I'm disturbed that two thirds of the teachers are very concerned about coming back to school. Um, I was glad to hear from Dave uh, that he would be in favor of delaying it till September 14th, I think he said. I'd like to hear Lori's response to that to see whether that might be something that would be helpful for the teachers to um, <clears throat> address some of the devil in the detail and also to give us a little bit more opportunity to see how things progress throughout the state. So it would be wonderful. However, we'd be going to school later in June for sure because we couldn't get that extra week. Um, and you know, I appreciate Nancy's work with the union members, and it wasn't 70% of the entire teaching staff. It was the 40 union members that were invited to participate in the survey. So we haven't really know all the teachers. And I think the wording was that personal, that, that you know, the personal sense of safety was really driving um, the survey. But the 14th, while it would be wonderful, I, there's no way I could get that passed as, um, instructional time. I can do it till the eight. Well, you could, but I'll tell you, the end of the school year is no bargain. No one wants to be in school until the end of June. All right, well, we did, we did vote for the eight at this point. Um, there's no reason to think we can't call another meeting if we have to. You have a point. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we don't want the kids to be delayed in starting. So why don't we circle back around, start at the original date, start with the remote model, get them going maybe do half days every day for a month so that we can continue to work on those plans, get the teachers the time that we need, get the schools the time that they need to get ready. In the meantime, the kids are getting an education with teachers remotely. It's just an idea. I mean, eight till 12, Monday through Friday, kids are remote learning. The rest of the day, we're able to work on the plans that we need to to get the schools ready to open safely. 
I know it's against what's already voted. <laughs> What was the date that Dave had suggested? September 18th? Okay, I'll make a motion to uh, delay the opening of school until Monday, September 14th. I'm waiting for a second. I'm not getting it. No second. No second for that. Okay, anything else tonight, folks? John? Motion to adjourn by Mr. Ruthberg. Anyone second that? All right. All in favor? Aye. Thank you all. The next meeting date is technically September 14th, unless we change it. <laughs>